I want to revisit the conversation with a clip from this past weekend of a Cornell professor expressing the exhilaration he says he felt after that attack happened. Let's roll that. Where is the rock going? The rock is shifted the balance of power. The rock has punctured the illusion of invisibility. There are many thousands of goodwill, many Palestinians, conscious, who have more violence as for you, as do I, who have more the targeting of civilians as for you, as do I, who were able to breathe. They were able to breathe for the first time in years. It was exhilarating. It was exhilarating. It was energizing. If they weren't exhilarated mm -hmm. by this, this challenge to the monopoly of violence, by this shifting of the balance of power, then they would not be human. I was exhilarated. He's exhilarated by the weight. First, let me just say that. I hear complaints that harping on the stuff from le lefty activists and professors is not as important as what's happening in Israel and Gaza. And that is absolutely true. But the reason I think it's worth talking about is because it's a real mask off moment for the social justice left. They, they use all these academic terms, decolonialization, shifting the power dynamic. But we are now seeing in practice what all of that means. It means we're okay with killing innocent people, non-combatants. Maybe we won't do it ourselves. Maybe we'll throat clear before, but we'll excuse it. Just like how we excuse the looting and destruction in the summer of 2020 with this out of context MLK quote about riots as the voice of the unheard. And it's just been years of microaggressions, silence is violence, punch fascists, and fascists is like everyone to the right of Hugo Chavez. That's what I hear with this rhetoric. You're giving permission to cheer slaughter. And as long as you're on the wrong side of the simplistic oppressor oppressed dichotomy, we're going to shrug at best when it happens. And, you know, you can criticize Israel's government all you want, and they, they should be criticized. I've criticized them some today, but you don't make excuses for barbaric killing because you agree with the cause. And it's just asking for something really ugly to happen in this country. And when it does, part of that is going to be on people like that guy. You're supposed to be an intellectual role model. So start acting like it. Yeah. I mean, my thoughts on this are a very strong and concise. Fuck that guy. Um, there is no excuse for that type of thing. Nothing about watching innocent people be murdered was exhilarating. Nothing about that was exciting. It was despicable. It was a horrible, unprovoked, senseless act of violence. And it's really stunning to me that people all across college campuses, sometimes at very elite schools, you know, we have this happening at Cornell. We have this happening at Harvard. Uh, we have this happening at the University of Pennsylvania. The degree to which the left has consistently, um, you know, the far left, the progressive woke campus activists and academics have really shown themselves to be simplistic in their understandings of foreign policy, uh, simplistic in their understandings of race relations, simplistic in, in sort of promulgating their colonizer narratives, acting as if you know, basically the racial dynamics and colonist dynamics of the United States can be mapped onto every other area in the world, which is obviously patently false. I mean, for about nine years now, these same people have been shouting about microaggressions and the need for safe spaces and shouting down campus speakers. Um, in one case, I remember, I think it was the Middlebury College case where they ended up also like uh, assaulting a a uh, the person. It was the Charles Murray Allison Stanger talk. They ended up yeah. assaulting Allison, uh, who, by the way, was the sort of slightly more lefty person presented as the foil, the person there to challenge Charles Murray. Um, so you literally, in some cases, have these 
these campus uh, speaker shoutdowns that are resulting in actual violence. And yet these are the same people who want to act like the littlest thing is a microaggression. I'm sorry, this is a fucking macroaggression. You don't get to stand on stage and, you know, talk about how exhilarating it is to see people be brutally raped and murdered. Uh, it's it's I, I wonder whether this will be the moment that the radical campus and academic left breaks. It feels like the cracks have been forming. It feels like some of the grift and corruption present in the Black Lives Matter organization and the higher ups like Patrice Cullors. It seems like people have really lost some faith in that. Um, we also saw a lot of sort of Hamas paraglider graphic design uh, co-opting by BLM and by DSA groups in the U.S., I wonder whether DSA, Black Lives Matter, and some of these woke campus groups will sort of completely lose credibility forever because of this moment. I think it's very possible. I mean, it's already becoming a liability because employers are trying to ask <laughs> if you are affiliated with this group or that group that did that. And, you know, I'm not someone who is for that kind of oppressive we might call cancel culture, uh, but the, to the degree that it does become a liability, I think that that there's a there's there's enough of a backlash where we we might start to see a little bit of that unwind. But whether it does or not, I mean, it, we need people to stand against that and call that crap out because we have to defend like the liberal society. We have to defend the idea that. It's not acceptable to violate people's rights and the, their life and their property just because they happen to be in a disfavored group. That's just like a fundamental bedrock of what this whole thing is supposed to be about. And these people, it it's reached a breaking point uh, for me, at least uh, with this, like that um, they are eroding that just really fundamental bedrock. And by the way, his assertion that, uh, oh, it's so exciting and exhilarating to see this power dynamic flip. Yeah. Like, what power dynamic, power dynamic yeah, even right. flipped? I mean, uh, Israel is uh, annihilating Hamas and the Gaza Strip is never going to be the same after. Like there, there hasn't been some sort of like amazing shift in power. Like we learned talking to Max Abrams last week, Terrorist attacks like this, they don't achieve their political objective. And the, Hamas's political objective is not to help the people in Gaza or the West Bank, at least in the short term. It's to bolster their image and, and put them at the center of some bigger movement. And they'll they'll rack up as much collateral damage as they need to to do so. So this I is uh, a really just disappointing and frustrating moment. I honestly feel like this is the second installment of the summer of George Floyd. Like, do you remember that moment in 2020 after George Floyd was brutally killed by cops and we're libertarians, we completely uh, reject the fact that so much police abuse of power exists and that type of thing is is absolutely horrific to watch. Um, you know, yes. reasons Billy Binion and CJ Ciramella have done excellent reporting on this. But right after that happened, there were all of those crazy protests, some of which were protests, a lot of them were riots. Uh, and you, you remember, I mean, it's it's now uh, a, an internet meme, uh, the idea of the mostly peaceful protest. And it was like, you right. know, some anchor talking about this as, you know, fires were burning in the background right behind him, right? Like these were riots and there was enormous uh, property destruction uh, that resulted from this. And on one hand, you could say, People have every right to to protest this horrific police killing, uh, but they uh, ended up really savaging American cities. I mean, it was awful. You had shop windows being boarded up uh, as if that's the sign of a functioning, healthy democracy. It was really sad. And I think for a lot of people, it was this moment where there was like, a oh, this isn't just advocating for police reform. This isn't just advocating for, you know, specific changes to qualified immunity, right? Like this is people engaging in these really brutal and sometimes violent methods of trying to get what they want politically um, from the left. And like, that's not something that we like. They sort of showed themselves no. a little bit. And I wonder yeah, I whether mean, we're currently seeing this in this current moment where there's an awful lot of, I think, legitimate anti-Semitism coming out and, um, a sense that I'm getting from some far left progressive activists that they authentically think that, you know, for 
people who they consider to be oppressed, it is perfectly okay to use violence to achieve the ends that they desire. And I disagree with that. And I think many normal people on the left disagree with that. I, I wonder what will happen uh, and whether these progressive far leftist ideals and talking points and groups will continue to exist for years to come or whether they will just lose credibility on mass as a result of this. Well, and I hope that they realize the degree to which they are tainting these conversations and the ability to have to advocate for police reform, which is necessary. None, none of us thought it was OK for Derek Chauvin to kneel on this guy until he died. And I'm glad that this this man is in prison. And I continue to be a, a believer in an advocate for criminal justice reform and, and police being held accountable for their actions and people not being sentenced to decades and decades in prison uh, when they shouldn't be. And similarly, I have so sympathy for aspects of the Palestinian cause. It's partly why I wanted to have Trita on here today to try to flesh that out a little bit and explain a, a little bit of the, the history and the grievances. I think it's not completely without merit, but when you are embracing or, you know, elevating this iconography, it, it taints the conversation and it, it just makes it th that much harder to, to make any progress on these issues. Hey, thanks for watching that clip from our conversation with Trita Parsi about whether the U.S. can and should de-escalate things in the Middle East. You can watch another clip right here or the full conversation over here.